after we were all on board the brig orleans proceeded down james river passing into chesapeake bay we arrived next day opposite the city of norfolk while lying at anchor a lighter approached us from the town bringing four more slaves frederick a boy of eighteen had been born a slave as also had henry who was some years older they had both been house servants in the city maria was a rather genteel looking coloured girl with a faultless form but ignorant and extremely vain the idea of going to new orleans was pleasing to her she entertained an extravagantly high opinion of her own attractions assuming a haughty mien she declared to her companions that immediately on our arrival in new orleans she had no doubt some wealthy single gentleman of good taste would purchase her at once but the most prominent of the four was a man named arthur as the lighter approached he struggled stoutly with his keepers it was with main force that he was dragged aboard the brig he protested in a loud voice against the treatment he was receiving and demanded to be released his face was swollen and covered with wounds and bruises and indeed one side of it was a complete raw sore he was forced with all haste down the hatchway into the hold i caught an outline of his story as he was borne struggling along of which he afterwards gave me a more full relation and it was as follows he had long resided in the city of norfolk and was a free man he had a family living there and was a mason by trade having been unusually detained he was returning late one night to his house in the suburbs of the city when he was attacked by a gang of persons in an unfrequented street he fought until his strength failed him overpowered at last he was gagged and bound with ropes and beaten until he became insensible for several days they secreted him in the slave pen at norfolk a very common establishment it appears in the cities of the south the night before he had been taken out and put on board the lighter which pushing out from shore had awaited our arrival for some time he continued his protestations and was altogether irreconcilable at length however he became silent he sank into a gloomy and thoughtful mood and appeared to be counselling with himself there was in the man's determined face something that suggested the thought of desperation after leaving norfolk the handcuffs were taken off and during the day we were allowed to remain on deck the captain selected robert as his waiter and i was appointed to superintend the cooking department and the distribution of food and water i had three assistants jim cuffy and jenny jenny's business was to prepare the coffee which consisted of corn meal scorched in a kettle boiled and sweetened with molasses jim and cuffy baked the hoe cake and boiled the bacon standing by a table formed of a wide board resting on the heads of the barrels i cut and handed to each a slice of meat and a dodger of the bread and from jenny's kettle also dipped out for each a cup of the coffee the use of plates was dispensed with and their sable fingers took the place of knives and forks jim and cuffy were very demure and attentive to business somewhat inflated with their situation as second cooks and without doubt feeling that there was a great responsibility resting on them i was called steward a name given me by the captain the slaves were fed twice a day at ten and five o'clock always receiving the same kind and quantity of fare and in the same manner as above described at night we were driven into the hold and securely fastened down scarcely were we out of sight of land before we were overtaken by a violent storm the brig rolled and plunged until we feared she would go down some were seasick others on their knees praying while some were fast holding to each other paralyzed with fear the seasickness rendered the place of our confinement loathsome and disgusting it would have been a happy thing for most of us it would have saved the agony of many hundred lashes and miserable deaths at last had the compassionate sea snatched us that day from the clutches of remorseless men the thought of randall and little emmy sinking down among the monsters of the deep is a more pleasant contemplation than to think of them as they are now perhaps dragging out lives of unrequited toil when in sight of the bahama banks at a place called old point compass or the hole in the wall we were becalmed three days 
there was scarcely a breath of air the waters of the gulf presented a singularly white appearance like lime water in the order of events i come now to the relation of an occurrence which i never call to mind but with sensations of regret i thank god who has since permitted me to escape from the thraldom of slavery that through his merciful interposition i was prevented from imbruing my hands in the blood of his creatures let not those who have never been placed in like circumstances judge me harshly until they have been chained and beaten until they find themselves in the situation i was borne away from home and family towards a land of bondage let them refrain from saying what they would not do for liberty how far i should have been justified in the sight of god and man it is unnecessary now to speculate upon it is enough to say that i am able to congratulate myself upon the harmless termination of an affair which threatened for a time to be attended with serious results towards evening on the first day of the calm arthur and myself were in the bow of the vessel seated on the windlass we were conversing together of the probable destiny that awaited us and mourning together over our misfortunes arthur said and i agreed with him that death was far less terrible than the living prospect that was before us for a long time we talked of our children our past lives and of the probabilities of escape obtaining possession of the brig was suggested by one of us we discussed the possibility of our being able in such an event to make our way to the harbour of new york i knew little of the compass but the idea of risking the experiment was eagerly entertained the chances for and against us in an encounter with the crew was canvassed who could be relied upon and who could not the proper time and manner of the attack were all talked over and over again from the moment the plot suggested itself i began to hope i revolved it constantly in my mind as difficulty after difficulty arose some ready conceit was at hand demonstrating how it could be overcome while others slept arthur and i were maturing our plans at length with much caution robert was gradually made acquainted with our intentions he approved of them at once and entered into the conspiracy with a zealous spirit there was not another slave we dared to trust brought up in fear and ignorance as they are it can scarcely be conceived how servilely they will cringe before a white man's look it was not safe to deposit so bold a secret with any of them and finally we three resolved to take upon ourselves alone the fearful responsibility of the attempt at night as has been said we were driven into the hold and the hatch barred down how to reach the deck was the first difficulty that presented itself on the bow of the brig however i had observed the small boat lying bottom upwards it occurred to me that by secreting ourselves underneath it we would not be missed from the crowd as they were hurried down into the hold at night i was selected to make the experiment in order to satisfy ourselves of its feasibility the next evening accordingly after supper watching my opportunity i hastily concealed myself beneath it lying close upon the deck i could see what was going on around me while wholly unperceived myself in the morning as they came up i slipped from my hiding place without being observed the result was entirely satisfactory the captain and mate slept in the cabin of the former from robert who had frequent occasion in his capacity of waiter to make observations in that quarter we ascertained the exact position of their respective berths he further informed us that there were always two pistols and a cutlass lying on the table the crew's cook slept in the cook galley on deck a sort of vehicle on wheels that could be moved about as convenience required while the sailors numbering only six either slept in the forecastle or in hammocks swung among the rigging finally our arrangements were all completed arthur and i were to steal silently to the captain's cabin seize the pistols and cutlass and as quickly as possible dispatch him and the mate robert with a club was to stand by the door leading from the deck down into the cabin and in case of necessity beat back the sailors until we could hurry to his assistance we were to proceed then as circumstances might require 
should the attack be so sudden and successful as to prevent resistance the hatch was to remain barred down otherwise the slaves were to be called up and in the crowd and hurry and confusion of the time we resolved to regain our liberty or lose our lives i was then to assume the unaccustomed place of pilot and steering northward we trusted that some lucky wind might bear us to the soil of freedom the mate's name was biddy the captain's i cannot now recall though i rarely ever forget a name once heard the captain was a small genteel man erect and prompt with a proud bearing and looked the personification of courage if he is still living and these pages should chance to meet his eye he will learn a fact connected with the voyage of the brig from richmond to new orleans in 1841 not entered on his logbook we were all prepared and impatiently waiting an opportunity of putting our designs into execution when they were frustrated by a sad and unforeseen event robert was taken ill it was soon announced that he had the smallpox he continued to grow worse and four days previous to our arrival in new orleans he died one of the sailors sewed him in his blanket with a large stone from the ballast at his feet and then laying him on a hatchway and elevating it with tackles above the railing the inanimate body of poor robert was consigned to the white waters of the gulf we were all panic-stricken by the appearance of the smallpox the captain ordered lime to be scattered through the hold and other prudent precautions to be taken the death of robert however and the presence of the malady oppressed me sadly and i gazed out over the great waste of waters with a spirit that was indeed disconsolate an evening or two after robert's burial i was leaning on the hatchway near the forecastle full of desponding thoughts when a sailor in a kind voice asked me why i was so downhearted the tone and manner of the man assured me and i answered because i was a freeman and had been kidnapped he remarked that it was enough to make any one downhearted and continued to interrogate me until he learned the particulars of my whole history he was evidently much interested in my behalf and in the blunt speech of a sailor swore he would aid me all he could if it split his timbers i requested him to furnish me pen ink and paper in order that i might write to some of my friends he promised to obtain them but how i could use them undiscovered was a difficulty if i could only get into the forecastle while his watch was off and the other sailors asleep the thing could be accomplished the small boat instantly occurred to me he thought we were not far from the belize at the mouth of the mississippi and it was necessary that the letter be written soon or the opportunity would be lost accordingly by arrangement i managed the next night to secrete myself again under the longboat his watch was off at twelve i saw him pass into the forecastle and in about an hour followed him he was nodding over a table half asleep on which a sickly light was flickering and on which also was a pen and sheet of paper as i entered he aroused beckoned me to a seat beside him and pointed to the paper i directed the letter to henry b northup of sandy hill stating that i had been kidnapped was then on board the brig orleans bound for new orleans that it was then impossible for me to conjecture my ultimate destination and requesting he would take measures to rescue me the letter was sealed and directed and manning having read it promised to deposit it in the new orleans post office i hastened back to my place under the longboat and in the morning as the slaves came up and were walking round crept out unnoticed and mingled with them my good friend whose name was john manning was an englishman by birth and a noble-hearted generous sailor as ever walked a deck he had lived in boston was a tall well-built man about twenty-four years old with a face somewhat pockmarked but full of benevolent expression nothing to vary the monotony of our daily life occurred until we reached new orleans on coming to the levee and before the vessel was made fast i saw manning leap on shore and hurry away into the city as he started off he looked back over his shoulder significantly giving me to understand the object of his errand presently he returned and passing close by me hunched me with his elbow with a peculiar wink as much as to say it is all right 
The letter, as I have since learned, reached Sandy Hill. Mr. Northup visited Albany and laid it before Governor Seward, but inasmuch as it gave no definite information as to my probable locality, it was not, at that time, deemed advisable to institute measures for my liberation. It was concluded to delay, trusting that a knowledge of where I was might eventually be obtained. A happy and touching scene was witnessed immediately upon our reaching the levee. Just as Manning left the brig, on his way to the post office, two men came up and called aloud for Arthur. The latter, as he recognised them, was almost crazy with delight. He could hardly be restrained from leaping over the brig's side, and when they met soon after, he grasped them by the hand, and clung to them a long, long time. They were men from Norfolk, who had come on to New Orleans to rescue him. His kidnappers, they informed him, had been arrested, and were then confined in the Norfolk prison. They conversed a few moments with the captain, and then departed with the rejoicing Arthur. But in all the crowd that thronged the wharf, there was no one who knew or cared for me. Not one. No familiar voice greeted my ears, nor was there a single face that I had ever seen. Soon Arthur would rejoin his family, and have the satisfaction of seeing his wrongs avenged. My family, alas, should I ever see them more? There was a feeling of utter desolation in my heart, filling it with a despairing and regretful sense that I had not gone down with Robert to the bottom of the sea. Very soon traders and consignees came on board. One, a tall, thin-faced man, with light complexion and a little bent, made his appearance with a paper in his hand. Birch's gang, consisting of myself, Eliza and her children, Harry, Lethy and some others, who had joined us at Richmond, were consigned to him. This gentleman was Mr. Theophilus Freeman. Reading from his paper, he called Platt. No one answered. The name was called again and again, but still there was no reply. Then Lethy was called, then Eliza, then Harry, until the list was finished, each one stepping forward as his or her name was called. Captain, where's Platt? demanded Theophilus Freeman. The captain was unable to inform him, no one being on board answering to that name. Who shipped that nigger? he again inquired of the captain, pointing to me. Birch, replied the captain. Your name is Platt. You answer my description. Why don't you come forward? he demanded of me in an angry tone. I informed him that was not my name, that I had never been called by it, but that I had no objection to it as I knew of. "'Well, I will learn you your name,' said he, "'and so you won't forget it either, by God,' he added. Mr. Theophilus Freeman, by the way, was not a whit behind his partner, Birch, in the matter of blasphemy. On the vessel I had gone by the name of Steward, and this was the first time I had ever been designated as Platt, the name forwarded by Birch to his consignee. From the vessel I observed the chain gang at work on the levee. We passed near them as we were driven to Freeman's slave pen. This pen is very similar to Goodin's in Richmond, except the yard was enclosed by plank, standing upright with ends sharpened, instead of brick walls. Including us, there were now at least fifty in this pen. Depositing our blankets in one of the small buildings in the yard, and having been called up and fed, we were allowed to saunter around the enclosure until night when we wrapped our blankets round us and laid down under the shed, or in the loft, or in the open yard, just as each one preferred. It was but a short time I closed my eyes that night. Thought was busy in my brain. Could it be possible that I was thousands of miles from home, that I had been driven through the streets like a dumb beast, that I had been chained and beaten without mercy, that I was even then herded with a drove of slaves, a slave myself? Were the events of the last few weeks realities indeed, or was I passing only through the dismal phases of a long, protracted dream? It was no illusion. My cup of sorrow was full to overflowing. Then I lifted up my hands to God, and in the still watches of the night, surrounded by the sleeping forms of my companions, begged for mercy on the poor forsaken captive. To the Almighty Father of us all, the freeman and the slave, I poured forth the supplications of a broken spirit, 
imploring strength from on high to bear up against the burden of my troubles until the morning light aroused the slumberers ushering in another day of bondage end of chapter five